Okay. Likely, one of the things when you hear the word Renaissance, you think about some of the advancements that are going on regarding science, right? One of those is astronomy. Now, over in, in the continent of Europe, working separately, Copernicus and Galileo worked to disprove the model universe that people believe for over 2,000 years. And this is the, the model universe that the Earth, right, is at the center of everything, and the moon and the planets as well as the sun, everything orbits around the Earth. That was believed for thousands of years, and it wasn't until the Renaissance that it was proven false, that the Earth revolved around the sun. Because of this, Galileo was eventually declared a heretic and placed an, under house arrest. Not nice. So the church was viewing itself as under attack from science. Then we can add to this the Reformation. When we talk about the Reformation, this is the Protestant Reformation. If you remember from earlier in the course, we touched upon how greedy the church had become. And the figure to the far left, this is Martin Luther. He was a German monk. And in 1517, he was really upset with what was going on. He, you know, let word go to the Pope. They said, hey, we need to stop this corruption. We're getting too greedy. Things are getting out of hand. And word came back from the Pope. I'm the Pope. You're a monk. You know, you do what I say. So Martin Luther, he wrote down his complaints and then nailed them on the church door. And this was the start of the Protestant Reformation. This was the first time ever anyone had openly criticized, made dissenting comments against the church. And a lot of people today, this really doesn't raise an eyebrow because there's so many different churches going, you know, churches pop into being all the time now. But you look at that bottom bullet point to the far left, this is the first time the true freedom of thought is possible. Because before, whatever the church said, was it. There was no such thing as going against what the church taught. Now, moving into the middle, when Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation and the Lutheran Church, what it really started to do was um, kind of a domino thing. Other religious figures started to leave the church and start their own churches. And King Henry VIII, there in the middle, when this was going on, he stood by the church. And now we can call the church the Catholic Church, because before the Protestant Reformation, churches didn't have names. But now, right, you're either Catholic or Protestant. So when the Protestant Reformation, excuse me, when the Protestant Reformation was first going on, King Henry VIII stood by the Pope and said, no, this is bad, we need to stay in the church. And he was named a defender of the faith by the Pope for attacking Protestants. Then he began an extended confrontation himself with Rome because he needed a legitimate male heir to the throne. He wanted to divorce his wife at the time, so he sent word to the Pope, said, hey, can I divorce my wife? And the Pope said, no. And he said, why? And the Pope said, well, because it's in the Bible. You know, it's, the Bible says you, you can't do it. And then it said, well, what if um, my wife dies? Can I get remarried? And Pope said, yeah, it's a different story. So I'm sure you're familiar with this. This is when King Henry goes through the process of beheading some of his wives and divorcing others. He ignores the Pope, and then the Pope boots him out. And he goes through six different cycles here before he finally gets a male heir to the throne. And then... Thereafter, King Henry started the Church of England, which today we call the Anglican Church. And he put himself as head of the church. So in England at this time, the king is not only the leader of the country, but also the church. 
So there's no separation of church and state. Now, when all this was going on with King Henry, the figure to the right, this is Thomas More. He was arguing against what King Henry was doing, which is not really a good thing when the king has absolute power. And he refused to recognize King Henry's authority over the Pope. And he was given a couple chances to recant and recognize that King Henry had authority over the Pope, but he never did, and he had his head chopped off. And then, boom, there we are. Wow, all this change going on in such a short time frame. If there was one central figure to the Renaissance and England, it is Queen Elizabeth. So, how do we get to Queen Elizabeth? Okay, this is, I always tell people, this is as crazy as a politics in America get, we don't, we don't get to this level of crazy, as we're about to see. After the death of the first male son of King Henry VIII's sixth wife, whew, Henry VIII's first wife's half-daughter becomes queen. And no, that's not going to be on any exam. This is is, we have to show how we get to Queen Elizabeth. And this is Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary is horror. She's Catholic. And she, so she's a Catholic leader of a Protestant country. It's just chaos. There's, you know, people really upset in the streets about being ruled by a Catholic queen. And she has to put down uprisings with force. That's why she's called Bloody Mary. Ugh. Then, 1558, Elizabeth, who's the daughter of King Henry's second wife, becomes queen. Now, Elizabeth is Protestant. She brings a feeling of calm and stability to England. The, the uprisings and things kind of settle down. She was a really, really, really good ruler very smart with economic policies. This is when England starts to colonize North America. She strengthened her rule over England when she cried, tried and executed her cousin, Mary Queen of Scotland, for treason. That's not nice, killing your cousin. And as well, she was, experienced military success with the defeat of the Spanish Armada. Wow. So we'll continue our look into Renaissance as it ties in with English literature in the next lecture.